One of the best aspects of Fallout 76 on release was the quantity as well as quality of some of the new creatures that were added to the game and introduced into the lore. They carried over basically every creature from Fallout 4, but even further, introduced a plethora of new ones, some being major, other ones relatively minor, and with the Wastelanders DLC, they built on top of this, adding in a few more creatures for you to explore, experience, and actually integrated pretty well. In this video, what I want to do is go over each of these creatures, the lore and backstory behind them, as well as how exactly you can find them. As with some of them, that is a pretty important aspect of their being. Finding them is the hardest part. If you enjoy this content or just enjoy a deeper dive into the story or lore of Wastelanders, I do encourage you guys to subscribe. There's going to be a lot more content of this type coming out over the next couple of weeks. The first new creature I want to take a look at is one you may have not even realized was added. Not because it's some major hidden feature that you just have never seen, but because it's relatively minor, that with the Owlette. As I mentioned a bit earlier in this video, Wastelanders brought a lot of these more miscellaneous or minor creatures to Fallout. You can find many of these new additions all throughout the world space just as you're exploring around, but one that is particularly sparse is the Owlette. Again, just being added with Wastelanders, for one reason or another, it seems like the only guaranteed spawn of the Owlette is in the deep. But it's not really that simple, because also in the deep you do get two cave crickets. And I would say roughly 90% of the time, unless you are rushing in there, the cave crickets will kill the owlet before you can actually see it in its living version. Oftentimes you'll just find its corpse laying there unless you're really quick to actually save the owlet from the cave crickets and be the hero you always wanted to be. As far as the creature itself goes, it's really simple. Another miscellaneous creature to spawn in the deep, clearly being a mutated owl. And if you do get some meat from this guy, you actually can cook it at a cooking station to get owlet nuggets, which will give you plus one intelligence. So not the most useful in the world, but definitely kind of handy. The owlet's actually one of those funny ones that's been in the files for a long time and was basically all the way implemented, but just wasn't implemented for some reason. You could in fact get a mounted owlet plan, and I'm sure many of you had from earlier DLCs, despite owlets never actually appearing. But then moving on, one creature that you probably have seen, what is without a doubt the most popular new creature, are the floaters. The floaters are pretty cool because they are a modern take on a classic Fallout enemy. Originally appearing in Fallout 1 and 2 and actually being cut from the official Fallout 3 release, floaters are effectively mutated flatworms but specifically mutated via the FEV virus, the same thing that led to the creation of the super mutants created by West Tech. So in game, at times, you can find super mutants and floaters working in tandem, the official lore basically being that the super mutants thought the floaters were cute and in turn took them on as pets, very similar to the mutant hounds. And in several instances, some of these random encounters now have a chance of either having super mutants with mutant hounds or with floaters as pets with them, although the floaters can also appear independent of the super mutants as they are just general creatures, creatures that happen to be adopted by super mutants sometimes. There's next to nothing in the way of new lore as far as the presence of the floaters in Appalachia. It seems like the super mutants adopted them as pets simply because they thought they looked cute or at least that is one of the voice lines you may be able to find in game. In the AMA, Bethesda did confirm that these are in fact the same floaters from the original Fallout, so it's not like it is a different variant, it's just these types are created by the Appalachian West Tech, while the other variants were created by the West Coast West Tech. But otherwise, the backstory seems pretty simple. West Tech created the FEV, exposed flatworms to the FEV, and thus we have the floaters. As far as how they appear in game, as you find the floaters, you'll often find them submerged in the ground, with some particles floating up above them. They of course do actually float, this is due to a flotation sac that is at the top of their bodies being filled with a noxious gas. That's the one other piece of lore we have from one of the loading screens, but they do come in several different types, a floater flamer, freezer, as well as nasher. But also floaters can have different ranks to them, so there are higher tier versions as your level goes up, and in turn they'll have different prefixes, which does entail not only additional health, but also additional damage output. One of the interesting things you'll find with the three different types of floaters is they actually have different attack methods. The floater Nasher, which is effectively the poison floater, is the simplest. He has two different attacks, that being this slap move that is basically just a melee attack, the floater is quite literally slapping you in the face, or from time to time he'll use the vampire 
Vampire Bite Attack. This will one, inflict you with poison damage, but two, actually restore some health for the floater. He's basically stealing health from you and using it on himself. When using that Vampiric Bite, he is inflicting poison on you and it will last for a couple of seconds, dealing damage over time. Conversely, the Floater Flamer is without a doubt the most devastating of the three. He has the ranged Fireball Attack, which without a doubt has the largest range out of any of the Floater attacks, but he further has the Devastating Flamethrower Attack, where just consistently over time he will shoot you with his flame and both of these attacks deal fire damage. And it seems like this is actual fire damage. The new damage type just added with the Wastelanders update, it also is applied to things like Molotov Cocktails, the Flamer, and this is important because it is a damage type that you probably don't have high resistance towards, and as such, the Flamer Floater actually does a ton of damage compared to the other two with without a doubt the weakest being the Floater Freezer. The Floater Freezer does have Freezer Breath, which is basically the same thing as the other Floater's Flamethrower, the big difference being with Freezer Breath you'll be gradually slowed and frozen over time, as well as a separate Ice Shard effect that effectively does the same thing except it's just one bolt of ice. This isn't nearly as long range as the Fireball and honestly isn't all that good. And just to really exemplify how much more powerful the Floater Flamer is versus the Floater Freezer, look how much quicker the Floater Flamer degrades my health. I could basically stand in front of the floater freezer all day using stim packs. The floater flamer will actually pose a real problem though. And this is because one is doing the new fire damage type while the other is just doing typical energy damage, which I have way more resistance towards. With the floater nashers being somewhere in the middle. All three of the floaters do have a death explosion and this does in fact deal damage. The flamer will set you on fire, the nasher will poison you, and the freezer will actually slow you. Throughout the game, when you find one floater, 95% of the time you're going to find the other two variants close by. These appear in a wide variety of locations. There's actually a really great write-up on the Fallout wiki right now which I'll have linked down below. But one of the other interesting parts of the floaters is they have unique drops associated with them. The flamer will drop fuel and waste oil, the freezer crystal shards and adhesive, and the nasher more adhesive and acid, but all of them also drop their own unique form of pus sack. These are important because the new pus sacks are actually used in creating the brand new weapon to Fallout 76, that with the floater grenades. There are three types of these, one for each type of floater, and each grenade type requires a pus sack, in order to unlock these, you can get them from Mortimer after you hit the Raider reputation rank of Friendly, and they are 150 gold bullion per. So as far as these grenades go, they're fairly expensive to get because you'll basically have to kill one floater per grenade. But even further, they're just really bad. I don't know if all grenades are this glitchy in Fallout 76, I don't tend to use grenades, but these ones would roll around, bounce around, and almost never actually land on target. But otherwise, in-game, after using one, each will have a little explosion where it does release one of the corresponding damage types, and then has a little puddling effect, although it doesn't really seem like that puddling effect does much damage at all. But overall, I think this is a really cool addition. Maybe if you have a more grenade-focused build, or you're just much better at them with me, these could be Valuable. In particular, it definitely seems like the Flamer version might be the best grenade out of the bunch, but overall, these are definitely pretty cool and unique enemies, ones that are very fitting in Fallout 76 and a callback to those OG versions. But then last but not least, we do have the big enemy, that with the Wendigo Colossus. I know for many of you, this is likely one you've been looking for, trying to experience for yourself, and to help you on that journey, all of the blue dots on this map, which will be linked down below, are a potential spawn point. But of course, to get the Wendigo Colossus to spawn, you must nuke one of those blue dots, or an area encompassing one. And there are a couple of nuke zones that actually encompass two. But after doing so, the Colossus has a 1 in 15 chance of spawning. And that's for the two hour duration of the nuke blast zone. So if you don't get the Wendigo Colossus initially, don't fret, what you could do was clear out all of the enemies at that point, fast travel away, wait roughly 10 minutes, then return to hopefully find either the Wendigo Colossus or new enemies, in which case just repeat the process. Although a important note, it seems like you can only do this once, after you spawn one Wendigo Colossus, there is a roughly 4 hour cooldown at that point. As far as the beast itself, oftentimes you'll just find it hanging out at one of these spawn points, standing there relatively idle, perhaps wandering around, perhaps stuck in a tree. It's a pretty massive creature that is a fairly tough opponent. It effectively seems like the merging of three Wendigo. For a little backstory or lore, the Wendigo is a real life cryptid in West Virginian lore, but in Fallout 76, they are effectively mutated humans that happen to be cannibals. The humans in question seem to be mostly the Gormans, one of the raider tribes in the region. 
But of course, at some point during this process, it isn't just turning into a ghoul, you actually are a now cannibalistic Wendigo. How you get from the stage of just a singular Wendigo to the now three-headed Wendigo Colossus isn't totally clear. There's not really a ton of lore behind this new variant, but it of course seems to have something to do with an additional mutation via an additional nuke zone. The enemy in game does have several different attacks. The boring and simple just melee attack, although seemingly this could come from each of its various heads. So just because you're standing in front of it doesn't mean it can only melee you from that direction. Also a ranged spitting attack, it'll fill up the sack on its throat and then spit the acid at you. But then of course the two very unique attacks this can do are the scream. As this is charging you can see what almost looks like a ring of Wendigo ghosts appear around you. And then when activated you do cower in fear in a random direction away from the Wendigo Colossus. You lose control of your character momentarily. And then of course finally the ability for it to call in or create its own sub subsequent Wendigo, which you will then have to fight in addition to the Colossus themselves. As far as the fight itself goes, it definitely is a boss tier enemy, having HP rivaling that of the Scorch Beast Queen, but large in part it is an easier enemy to take down than the Scorch Beast Queen, because the Wendigo Colossus doesn't fly. You can land consistent shots on it with your weapon, or just hit it with melee, which you can't always do with the Scorch Beast Queen. But it definitely is a more fun and engaging fight, fighting the Colossus itself, but also some of the subsequent Wendigo. After you finish off the fight, you do get a guaranteed legendary spawn, because it is always a legendary enemy. But even further, you get a unique item with the Wendigo Colossus Vocal Sack. Currently in game, if you try and scrap this, it is one of those items that it'll kind of warn you, you have to double tap the scrap at a scrap box. Typically, this is reserved for items that have a deeper purpose, such as the items required for floater grenades that we talked about earlier. At this point in time, this doesn't have an additional crafting recipe. There isn't some crazy one to go weapon, although it does make a pretty cool prop that you can put in a display case. What I'm assuming is that perhaps there is an additional Wendigo crafting item coming in the future. Bethesda has confirmed that a new Wendigo event is on the way, something involving the Colossus directly, hopefully a way to get it to more consistently spawn in the world. As of right now, we just know it's coming this summer. From data mining, we know it's going to be at the Monaga Mine. So even though right now in Appalachia, the Wendigo Colossus is a fairly rare encounter, something you don't see super often. In the future, hopefully one, you'll be seeing a lot more of him, but two, he'll have a greater role with this new event. But otherwise, yeah, that is a look at the three new enemies that came to Fallout 76 with the Wastelanders update. Hopefully you guys found this video enjoyable. I personally think all three of these are pretty cool new additions. I think they're definitely quality ones. And even though it's only really two of these that are substantial, I feel like both of them are interesting new encounters that are memorable, not just some throwaway forgettable creature. As always again, I thank you all for watching, hopefully you enjoyed this video, but with that, I hope to see you all next time. Later.